Let us start. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to be able to present you my interlocutors at this round table. Uh, next to me is uh, Tim Modlin, uh, Professor of Philosophy at the Department of Philosophy uh, at uh, New York University, and he does uh, fundamentals of physics. Um, next to him is Hero Stefancic, and um, he works at the Institute Roger Boschkovich, and he's a theoretical physicist and a cosmologist. And uh, next to him is Antonio Schieber, uh, who is also a theoretical physicist, and he works at the Institute of Physics. Now, the, the organizers thought that it would be a good idea if we are having a conference organized at the Institute of Philosophy uh, called Philosophy in Dialogue with Sciences uh, to have some um, uh, high-profile, um, excellent scientists uh, here available uh, to, to talk about uh, philosophy and the avenues it can be in dialogue with sciences. Uh, I myself am in a slightly uncomfortable uh, position of an intrusive moderator. Now, what is an intrusive moderator? It's somebody who's going to moderate the round table but also who is uh, supposed to um, say something about this topic. And what I'm going to say is going to be very brief in a couple of minutes, and then I'm going to ask uh, my interlocutors also to say uh, uh, five to 10 minutes, not more, about uh, how they envision the, uh, this relationship between philosophy and, and um, sciences, or in particular, the science that is physics, uh, and, and also to somehow spotlight uh, the mutual and reasons uh, or mutual distrust between these uh, disciplines and perhaps how to overcome and whether they should be overcome in the first place. So um, just, very, just very briefly, I think that Tim comes from a, Tim comes from a slightly different culture, academic culture, one in which philosophers and, and scientists uh, are less distrustful than what I think happens to be the case uh, on the continent. And, uh, we largely uh, belong to the tradition, the continental tradition. Now the, the reasons are um, uh, many. And they are quite deep, and I think that the root of the problem goes to our uh, education and basically to the to the curriculum. And I have a daughter who is in the second grade of her elementary school, and uh, the teacher says, uh, "Yeah, she's not very good at mathematics, but she's really, really good in English and in um, in painting. Uh, so don't worry." And I suppose when I talk to my, to my daughter, she says, well, you know, I, I really don't like mathematics. I'm going to be like you. <laughs> so, I don't know mathematics. Actually, she's, she's, I mean, she's spot on. Um, I can, I can, I can uh, testify from my own experience that uh, I, had, I had pretty poor uh, mathematics in my elementary school and also in, then in my high school. And this largely predetermined uh, my, my career. And then I noticed that a lot of people came into humanities because they disliked sciences. Uh, they just don't like you know, these formulae and, and mathematics and physics and all of these yucky things. It's really difficult and they're not into it. So they do humanities. And on the other hand, uh, I, was, uh, I also had the pleasure of meeting uh, uh, people who ended up in hard sciences who would say things like, yeah, you know, I, I like things to be black and white. So you can, you know, it's either this way or that way, you can calculate it. And I like that. Uh, I don't like shady things. I don't like places where rhetoric can make a difference. So, you know, I want numbers. Uh, so they ended up in, uh, in physics or in biology, uh, less often in mathematics. And of course, now they have their careers, and uh, uh, 
uh, through their careers, they have built themselves into authorities in their respective fields. So if they're humanists, they still don't know any mathematics. And now they have to justify that. So you know, uh, uh, humanities are underrated. Uh, the, the, the scientists are overrated and they're overpaid, definitely. And, uh, and also, they, there, is a, there are all sorts of um, conspiracy theories as to why science is, uh, is so successful. And on the other hand, uh, there are people at, at, um, at, at uh, physics or mathematics or biology department who just think, you know, philosophy, that's all complete nonsense. Uh, uh, I'm so happy not to be there. As far as I'm concerned, you can burn that and you know, save some money uh, for real things. Mm -hmm. And although, although I, I don't think that science has an answer to everything, uh, uh, I do see why scientists would uh, have qualms uh, with philosophers, especially on the continent, where this division between the two, uh, between the two fields uh, is so strong, and it is fostered through the very curriculum. So uh, I think that a way to bridge the gap uh, would actually be a long process, which would start with, with, a, with reforming the curriculum so that, so that uh, uh, humanities students just wouldn't be able to do their humanities without taking uh, you know, at least uh, you know, physics 101 or chemistry 101, but some uh, uh, some um, uh, hard science courses as well as the other way around. And this has been a f successful formula at, at many univer at universities in, in the United States, where humanities majors are supposed to take, uh, it's obligatory for them to take a few courses from from hard sciences and vice, and vice versa. And I think that's uh, directly correlated with the fact that in the in, in the United States, um, uh, philosophy and physics, though there are problems occasionally, there are these de big debates where scientists are going to accuse philosophers of being moronic philosophers and things like that. We've we've recently had them, uh, which was very bitter. Um, uh, that is that is happening to a lesser degree, I think, than in uh, than in the continent, where there is ignorance uh, at best. And, that, and therefore, uh, uh, just uh, trying to avoid talking to, uh, to people in the other field. Uh, or uh, even, even worse, there can be um, you know, uh, throwing things at the other discipline in order to either justify your own or try to, to repair things a little uh, you know, financially or in terms of um, academic policies. So that's what, what I, would, I would like. Uh, I would like to say, and I'm sure that it's going to be in contrast with what Tim is going to say. Well, actually, let me make a contrast. Let me make a contrast, because I think, in, in a way, <coughs> there's a subtext to what you just said, which is a, a little more bleak um, than it needs to be. So actually, just let, let me just make a comment about the relationship between philosophy, mathematics, and physics. Because it sounded as though um, one analysis of this is is that mathematics is, as it were, is the sieve. Um, if you if you don't like math, you're not good at math. You get shoved off into the humanities, right? Um, and if you're good at it, then you sort of might wander over. And and that somehow it's that's where you're also going to get an inability to communicate very well because if you're one side, it's very mathematical. Um, so let me just make a comment, which is, which is that at the level of the sorts of questions I'm interested in, which are also the level of questions that friends of mine who are physicists and math mathematicians are interested in, which is the very foundational level, the bottom level, as it were, the level where you get clear about the basic concepts, um, you don't need a lot of mathematical sophistication. Um, so when I was in when I was doing my PhD in history and philosophy of science, we were we were required, and this is an example of the sort of thing that not only not forbidden but actually required to take courses in a science at a graduate level. So I was taking graduate level physics courses as I was doing my degree because the idea was to actually know something about the field that you're commenting on. Um, but what would happen is I would go and take a course in say. Uh, uh, quantum theory, and for the from the point of view of foundational questions, if anything of interest was said, 
and it often nothing of interest was said. It was said on the first day. And then the rest of the time was simply learning how to solve problems, right? How to use a Green's function to integrate something, okay? Now, th there's a certain sense in which I could explain to you the foundations of Newton's theory of gravity in an hour. And at a conceptual level, you would understand it. It doesn't mean you could solve a three-body problem. It doesn't mean you could actually calculate when an eclipse would occur. But you would understand why the theory predicts when eclipses will occur, right? You would understand what the theory says there is and more or less how it behaves. And so, the, the, you know, sometimes <coughs> physicists will have to learn a lot of detailed mathematics and they'll try and, and you know, intimidate philosophers by flogging this. But often a lot of the detailed mathematics, the very hard mathematics, isn't really relevant to the foundational questions. And in fact, there's a lot more communication that could occur um, at a deep fundamental level that wouldn't, a lot of mathematics wouldn't so much get in the way. Um, now, what are the problems with having that communication? Well, there are problems on both sides. Um, sometimes, for certain realms of philosophy, there are philosophers who just have convinced themselves they don't care about science, which seems to be just idiotic. Um, at least, the nature of space and time is a long-standing problem that philosophers discuss. And if you're in the philosophical tradition, you want to care about it. And if you care about it, you want to learn something about relativity. I mean, that's just... You know, if you don't learn about relativity, you're not in a position to intelligently discuss it. Um, on the other hand, because of these peculiarities about not being clear about quantum mechanics, physics since the 20s has developed in a, in a, in, at some times in a rapidly anti-philosophical vein, which is a vein of also being very intolerant of fundamental physical questions, not philosophical questions, but just the sort of questions I was trying to talk about. What is your physical theory postulating as physically existent um, you know, at a fundamental level, at a microscopic level? Uh, and it's a weird historical situation, because Bohr had a kind of very, in a way, developed but extremely obscure philosophy that quite honestly nobody understands. And for a while, the idea was you just repeat what Bohr said. But then, People got embarrassed because they couldn't really explain what it meant, so then it became just shut up and calculate, as, as I guess Feynman said, right? And it's true, even today, in a lot of physics departments. I mean, I teach a course in philosophy of physics, and I'll get physics students, and I will not unusually get physics students who say, this is what I always hoped my physics courses would cover. You know, what is quantum mechanics about? What's really going on? Um, so I think with, with, with a certain amount of, of of acknowledgement on the philosophy side that there are clearly some philosophical questions, the ones dealing with the nature of the material world, which have to be informed by physics. And with some acknowledgement on the physics side that physics has drifted away from its historical aim of trying to be very clear and precise about what the theories are telling you exist, um, you'd see that there's this very interesting set of issues that sit at the bottom and in the center that everybody ought to be able to, 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 to talk about. Um, but I do think it's a little, it, it makes it too scary to sound like the passport is a high level of mathematical sophistication. I actually don't think you need a high level of mathematical sophistication to understand the basic problems. Um, I mean, to understand the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, you have to understand what a linear what, what a linear operator is, and I can again explain that in 15 minutes. Everybody can understand it. It's not that you need really high power. You know, you don't have to know how to integrate by parts, or you know, high, God knows what. It, 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 it's at a different level, it's, but it's at a level where one wants to be conceptually very clear about what's going on, and it's that lack of clarity. And there's a certain kind of obfuscation that can come from philosophical traditions, and a different kind of obfuscation that can come from certain kinds of physical practice. And you know, if you get rid of both of them, then everybody's sort of interested in the same issues. Yeah. But but you still do need some mathematics. You need a you need a, a bit, but 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 honestly, not it, not a lot to really understand it at quite an adequate level. I mean, I I I I think you're much 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 more likely to overestimate than underestimate mm. um, the level of mathematical sophistication you need to really grasp what the fundamental issues are. You want to say a few words? Well, uh, maybe I could uh, just uh, 
confirming a bit what uh, my predecessor has just <coughs> said, actually my experience, my impression is that exactly at the time when a big change is made uh, in a, uh, some physical uh, branch, uh, then actually the discussion and development does not require much mathematics. Uh, when, you, when you are uh, bringing in new ideas, even the best physicists usually talk about them in qualitative terms. And they are trying to establish perhaps a calculation uh, at the order of magnitude uh, level. So just to say, okay, this is big, this is small, this is, this is bigger than some other effect, uh, this is a major contribution or something like that. As um, the development in that branch or in that particular field or subfield of physics progresses, more and more mathematics <coughs> comes in. And uh, uh, usually very uh, elaborate or very intricate mathematical formalisms have to be used in order to make uh, uh, specific calculations that will actually give you a a result that you can compare with uh, observations or, or experimental uh, results. Now, perhaps a part of, of the problem is that uh, majority of physicists, or uh, actually I would say even majority of uh, scientists, uh, participate in this elaboration uh, phase in which uh, uh, a lot of mathematics or a lot of uh, technical skill or, or specific scientific methods have to be employed in order to make uh, steady progress. So uh, I think that this uh, uh, understanding of role, let's say mathematics in, in theoretical physics, that is my field, is that uh, uh, most of people and most of the time have to use mathematics. But in order to uh, handle the really fundamental conceptual issues, then you, you don't need much mathematics. Uh, but as I said, usually a smaller number of people uh, work uh, on foundations, on concepts, and uh, many more uh, simply uh, do the calculations. As uh, all of them together make the community of physicists, then you will also see their attitude towards calculation, important calculation, and its role, uh, role of, uh, of uh, higher level mathematics, to put it that way, in producing their results. So it's a kind of a, uh, maybe even uh, sociology of, of uh, science, but it's, a, it's an important effect and it might have its role in this uh, understanding between, uh, uh, <coughs> let's say, physicists and uh, philosophers. Uh, the input from philosophers uh, is uh, and can be very important at these uh, at, at these phases when uh, conceptual issues have to be cleared, when uh, uh, some foundational questions have to be answered. So, essentially, I agree, uh, but uh, this. Uh, so, so to say, uh, mathematical filter is still uh, important because it comes in uh, for most of physicists most of the time. But, but uh, somebody can somebody can say uh, so. There, certainly, there are some conceptual issues. You can even call them philosophical issues, which are which are then defining defining new fields or they, they are they're making new paths uh, in, in science. But somebody can say, uh, sure, <coughs> but these are again going to be scientists who are working on these on these questions. Uh, so why should they, you know, what is the why should philosophers be there? Uh, sure, philosophy. Yeah, let's 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 leave the doors open um, uh, for people to do their own work. So the question is still one can one can argue that these conceptual measures uh, uh, a physicist can get from you know from from learning physics, not from learning philosophy. Well, that's really the question of drawing uh, the line or some kind of border between philosophy uh, and science. Uh, I mean, a lot of work in that phase is related to structuring your thoughts, to uh, uh, making uh, uh, 
ever more uh, organized uh, logical structure uh, of uh, your concepts and uh, ideas. So uh, that indeed, one in the end can say that's a realm of uh, the very science that uh, is uh, dealing with these fundamental issues, but uh, by the very terms that are used, you could see that uh, philosopher, especially uh, well informed in, uh, in uh, uh, contemporary problems in, in science can make make a contribution. It's uh, uh, for me. Uh, I cannot actually speak from my own experience because here in Croatia, I would say that uh, uh, communication is not that, uh, that good. But uh, many times. Uh, even physicists speak of uh, certain philosophy uh, when, 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 the, uh, when the concepts or, uh, are still not uh, cleared or absolutely defined. So maybe they do it uh, uh, a bit... Uh, a pejorative way. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's not what I wanted to say. Uh, Perhaps uh, the colloquial way, but uh... although South Slavic languages are peculiar in that to, the verb to philosophize has a has a pejorative connotation, uh, I think we are unique for that. Uh, Antonio, uh, would you like to say a few words about this? Yeah, sure. <coughs> um, I, I I don't like this um, sociological aspect that are appeared in the discussion. Uh, what should we have in the curriculum, mm -hmm. uh, how should uh, uh, philosophy courses be implemented. And I mean, I mean it's uh, uh, there to decide. I liked my philosophy course at, at university. I liked it very much, so I would like to have it back, right? But uh, in fact, philosophy has always been there with physics. I mean, the, the idea of, uh, of a center of the solar system moving it from Earth and putting it into the Sun is the conceptual progress. It has nothing to do with mathematics. But hey, nobody will believe you if you cannot predict the time that the Sun is going to appear there. So if you want to get, uh, if you want to be taken seriously, you need to predict something. Even if you have a completely novel concept, you need to predict something in order to be taken seriously. And uh, you can really predict only if you do some mathematics, right? Otherwise, in science, you are just one of the competing theory in the market, right? It's perhaps true, but until we calculate, we will never know. That is the reason why the mathematics is so important in the present-day scientific community, right? Because most of people do just mathematics. The theory and concepts are already there. We mostly know what to do with them, right? Except for quantum mechanics, yeah. I agree with you, right? So the quantum mechanics, right? Yeah. So uh, it's true, I think Bohr uh, contributed a lot with uh, his thought experiments and uh, uh, discussions with Einstein in introducing the philosophy to, to quantum mechanics. And to tell you the truth, I, I don't think that it can be really formulated uh, strictly without at least, uh, you know, escaping a bit into philosophy, defining the wave function collapse or many worlds or whatever. You, you need to introduce whatever you believe is real, right? And for me, that's the most important change in, the, in physics. We started from something that we thought was the objective reality. Right? There is something. We see, okay, we see it. We are the observers. But we do believe it's there, right? The moon is there, the, 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 the buildings are there, and everything's there. It's, it's, uh, we define it in our own ways, in our own language, in our own mathematics, but it's still there. Right? We believe in it. And then um, we found out that it all really depends on uh, whether we are looking at it or not, in some interpretations at least. Most of them. But not all. <laughs> but not all right? but if, you, if, you decide, if you opt for another interpretation, then some other problems will appear, right? So, uh, 
in that sense, the, the physics moved from being uh, completely and totally objective to somewhat, uh, somewhat postmodern. I would say. <laughs> we, we are somehow including including us in all that story. Although serious physicists would tell you, well, uh, please don't, don't tell it about it that way. <laughs> you should be telling it to the general public, right? <laughs> they may misunderstand it, right? So. Uh, uh, but still, we can calculate a lot. Sure. Even with, with, with that problem, we can project nuclear bombs or right, Absolutely. whatever <laughs> you take <laughs> as a measure of, of, of quality. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but but there, there is a problem, as you said, what, what, is, what is reality? What constitutes reality? In my opinion, I always thought of this uh, change of emphasis in physics as, a, as a, some sort of acceptance of uh, ourselves looking in the mirror, right? We, we started developing our theories and our tools and our mathematics and everything, and in the end, we found ourselves looking there, right? So, so in, in the sense, it all means something to us. Oh, we, we found ourselves. Whether it has any meaning outside that, right, is um, in the end not important. I, I don't know whether well, you understand me. Right? The last part I don't understand. So, so let me just start the dialogue a little. Um, clearly, there were people, physicists, who, defend, who, who put forward exactly the set of ideas you, you've articulated. Um, and, and there's a famous, right, so there's a famous story about Einstein, um, who he's remarking to, but he said, do you really believe the moon isn't there if nobody looks at it? Exactly, and, right? Um, and, or and, and David Berman famously wrote in one article, we now demonstrably have proved the moon is not there if nobody looks at it. And we have done no such thing. I mean, this is a, a <coughs> physicist making a claim about what physics has proven, which is simply untrue, because I can give you theories where the moon is there whether anybody's looking or not, um, and they give you all the predictions of quantum mechanics. Okay, so the, the, Observed quantum phenomena do not show that the moon fails to exist if nobody's looking. And you know, when you say at the end, does it really matter? I can't imagine anything that would matter more than that. I mean, if I honestly believed that there was no moon and no sun and no stars until human beings developed, and then I'm going to wonder how the hell did they develop? I mean, you know, but there was nothing going on. How did they evolve? I mean, it's a, it's that would be the most bizarre amazing change in my picture of the universe that I could imagine. Now, I personally don't believe it, and I know there are ways of understanding quantum mechanics that don't require it, and I think they're much more reasonable than the ways that do. Um, so it, it's just the last part. I mean, I, I think, you see, <coughs> sometimes I feel like um, 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 not a philosopher, but just the conscience of a physicist going around and saying, these are really interesting physical questions, right? They're not, they're not outside your domain as a physicist to say, you should really care whether the moon is there or not when you don't look, right? You should not be satisfied as a physicist if you say, I'm not sure or it doesn't really matter, right? You should say, it really matters to me as a physicist to understand whether the moon is there when I'm not looking, you know? Um, um, and, and so it's, you know, it is a kind of odd thing to try to call physicists back to their vocation, which is to understand the world. Um, and, you know, it could turn out, I mean, I, I can't rule out that human observation is somehow playing a very much more central, significant role in all of this than you would have thought, but we don't know that, and you, know, and, and you can certainly come up with theories where that isn't true. You know. uh, can I just quickly reply? Sure. Yes. I, I don't think the observation that is uh, typically put, uh, that is typically being emphasized in, in these interpretations, is something that really matters. In, in my free, sort of free, non-typical non opinion about it, is that the, the problems with the observation simply, in a certain way, say, these are the theories that we invented. So, so it, it is a, somehow, as a, somehow as at the bottom of, of the knowledge, of the perception, of, of the final theory, we find that they talk to us. They don't talk about the objective universe. See what I mean? <laughs> I, I mean, that, that's one weird yeah. and free interpretation of quantum mechanics and the, 
Uh, but, but by the way, I'm sure you would disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that uh, uh, we should not be that surprised that uh, we arrive at uh, confusing or non-intuitive concepts at space scales or time scales or energy scales or temperature scales that are so different than our natural surroundings. What we have to know that uh, <coughs> these strange concepts of quantum physics, of relativity, uh, simply happen at very small distances in short times, or uh, that mainly refers to quantum mechanics, or uh, at uh, cosmological or astrophysical distances where the effects of rel general relativity might be observed, uh, or uh, large uh, uh, values of speed of particles where special relativity effects might be, might be uh, uh, observed. So, uh, in a way, uh, one could say that this is kind of an inverse ar argument that uh, as we uh, go away uh, from our, our typical scale, uh, some, some, I would say, characteristic parameters of our existence that then we become uh, confused and the questions seem uh, intriguing and unclear. So, uh, in a way, uh, our existence might have that kind of effect on, 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 on our theories. Because uh, they refer to, to, to something that is far away from us. Can, can I just make a comment? Because, again, I, I think that makes it sound like the problem's a little too easy. Because if you thought, so here's a natural thought. Um, our conceptual system evolved in order to solve problems in mesoscale, getting food. Um, and maybe the concepts we're familiar with for solving those problems are just not the right concepts for understanding things at micro scale, or cosmological scale. Um, of course, you might be amazed that we can have any science at all that works well at those scales, which we do have, so that's an interesting observation as well. But it, I think it, it misrepresents the situation a little to say the problems are there. So let me just give you a, a recent example. I'm sure everybody is familiar with this. Um, and this is all at meso scale. This is all at human scale. So you have this idea that you have these black holes. You can, if, if a star collapses, it has enough mass. It's going to form a black hole. And there's a region called the event horizon, which is defined because classically, if things go beyond it, they can't ever come out again. So if you pass the event horizon going in toward a black hole, you're, you're fated to, to end up in there. You're never going to get away. Good. And then uh, Stephen Hawking sort of famously did a calculation in quantum field theory saying that, that there would be a radiation that would come. If you have a black hole like that, it would actually radiate. There would be what's called Hawking radiation coming out. Okay. Good. And in some sense or other, the temperature of it gets higher and higher the closer you get to the event horizon. Now, some people started to argue. They said, well, OK, so what will happen if I'm just a guy, not a tiny, but a, a human being, yes? And I fall into an event horizon. What will happen to me? And they were saying the most famous, well-known, fetid physicists were saying things like, there was one, at least, who was saying things like this. Well. If I'm looking at you from the outside, you'll get incinerated by the Hawking radiation. You'll burn up because you're going into this very high temperature radiation field, right? You will, I will see you burn up. But if you're the actual person falling through, you won't burn up. You'll go right through. You'll sail right through the event horizon and keep going. Now, this is not a problem at micro scale. <laughs> <laughs> and I had discussions with physicists, and I, you know, I had to point out what you're telling me is insane, right? It makes no sense. Um, it's not, you know, either the person burns up or they don't. Um, or I would say, you know, put them on a rocket with a with a with a thermometer on it that'll, you know, set off a nuclear device if it goes above a certain temperature. It's either going to blow up or it isn't. You can't say from the outside it blows up, but for the person riding on it, he goes right through fine. You know, this is just incoherent. It's not enough to gesture and say, oh, it's at micro scale. We don't understand it. This is just crazy. And it turns out it is crazy. And now, you know, when you, I mean, in the last 
few months, now they have new ideas. They're putting, they're burning them up right after they go beyond the event, right? And they're doing crazy things. And these are just matters of people being, physicists being conceptually unclear about what they're doing. They often cobble together, cobble together theories with a little bit of classical mechanics here, and a little bit of, of thermodynamics there, and, you know, and they sort of are very, it's, it's not a really principled argument they're giving. And in fact, they put together arguments that just don't cohere with themselves. Um, you know, philosophers are, ought to be trained to spot stuff like that, right? One thing philosophers ought to be trained to do is sort of have very, maybe too neat and tidy, but neat and tidy little conceptual systems and, you know, see what follows from what. And, and you know, you need to hold their feet to the fire a little bit sometimes. Um, because this is, again, this is not, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I, I don't know if you've been following. There is a big debate about firewalls, all this stuff. And it's just, um, you know, I, I think they're just being sloppy in their thinking, and that's one thing you hope for. Is you're <coughs> trying to be, you know, a little bit rigorous. Okay. Well, let's let's open the possibility for the public to ask questions. Mladen, if you want to ask. Well, I'm sorry to add to this, for what it's worth. Even before Hawking radiation and quantum physics, we've got the twins problem in the special relativity. One twin is supposed to be older than the other, except it isn't. He or she isn't. Um, so who's, who's blame is there? Is it the physics problem or the philosophy problem? No, no, but that's not, there's no paradox there. <laughs> yeah. Read my book. Yeah, we find, we we've written the problem. The both communities took it as a problem for a sufficient length of time. Um, no. People who didn't understand relativity <laughs> oh, okay. took it as a problem because they didn't understand relativity. <laughs> right. that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a problem from somebody who thinks what the theory of relativity tells you is that all motion is relative. Which is just well, false. <laughs> this is just people who don't understand the theory. And, and it's true, the, among them were physicists. There were certainly, it's not as if physicists magically understood relativity, you know, instantly. Even Einstein. You know, it took a long time to get clear about what relativity was. But once you get clear about it, there's a <coughs> problem. Uh, I would like to comment, uh, actually, on this example. Well, this is, this is uh, a kind of a problem or uh, incoherence that appears at, at the front where uh, actually the full understanding of uh, gravity in the quantum regime has not still been achieved, not in a fully consistent way. So uh, essentially uh, all these paradoxes that uh, uh, you are referring to uh, are simply a reflection of an unfinished business, uh, of a, a problem that is still under consideration and that actually is uh, at the center of uh, physics, of uh, Heimlich physics, or however you want to call, it, call it, this field. Uh, so, uh, essentially, exactly these paradoxes, actually, although they uh, kind of uh, sound embarrassing, they produce uh, a lot of uh, energy to be able to resolve them. So, uh, although uh, at first it might seem like a short shortcoming even to encounter them during uh, evolution of a uh, Field, uh, some of them proved uh, extremely useful uh, in the history of science. So um, I agree that uh, uh, it's uh, again very useful uh, if uh, somebody uh, <coughs> points to it and says, "Okay," because as uh, especially when things get very mathematical, then uh, people. Uh, this has happened in some fields, uh, try to pay more attention to mathematical uh, or internal mathematical consistency than to, uh, well, let's say, consistency with uh, uh, empirical data or if observational or experimental data does not exist, then uh, uh, to, let's say, these logical uh, Problems or pro problems uh, in, in logic that might, might appear. So uh, inconsistencies are not that bad uh, after all. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, for for uh, as, a, as, a, as a as an engine. Of <laughs> yeah, and not only the physics, but the philosophy as well. And, uh, Bertrand Russell say, says that um, that a philosopher should be very keen on collecting paradoxes because these are these are going to put things at a test. No, no, no it, the problem. I mean. <coughs> So just to finish the story, if people aren't familiar with it, 
the, 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 the problem, again, goes back to Bohr, because Bohr introduced this notion of complementarity. And the, in the original problem that you say, look, if you're looking from the outside, the guy blows up, and, and according to the guy himself, he doesn't blow up. The answer is supposed to be a new concept, black hole complementarity. Both are true, but not somehow. You can't say them both at the same time. I mean, this was, there's a historical idea that the only way to understand quantum mechanics is to change logic, um, to use quantum logic, or to change the very principles of understanding. And this has done all, kind, made all kinds of a mess um, in physics. So, of course, recognizing that you've got a paradox or recognizing that you've got an inconsistency can be a very important spur to sort things out because you recognize something's going wrong somewhere. The problem is, when this originally came out, when you pointed that out, it wasn't, oh, something's going wrong somewhere. It's, that's okay. It's okay that the guy blows up according to the outside observer and doesn't blow up according to himself. And you want to say, no, 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 that really is a problem, right? You really need to resolve it. <laughs> okay, uh, Professor Zhukovic had a question. Oh. I'm reading the play, but I disagree with your interpretation of black hole radiation. Because if black hole is uh, has really uh, equivalent to the temperature of black hole, it's uh, inversely proportional to the surface of black hole. So if black hole is uh, bigger, normal black hole has a temperature somehow only about uh, one degree Kelvin about up to the surface. So you don't have, and that point in the radiation is very, very weak, extremely weak. So you cannot, you cannot burn, uh, if, if it were, if it did exist, black hole would eva evaporate. And we don't, they don't evaporate except for very tiny black holes which are minuscule. Those black holes which we, we uh, by, by uh, uh, radiating that huge amount of energy, they would radiate also their mass and just evaporate. That's impossible to get that the temperature in the plane. Yeah, okay, okay. it wasn't my claim, okay? I no, mean, the no, stuff no. about people being <laughs> consumed by hockey radiation, no, it, no, this isn't no, no. something I made up. I, I mean, read the papers by Hoyting, I know it. I, I, I know. Even, even that Hoyting was not originally Hoyting idea, you know. That was the idea of one of the students of him who Hoyting dismissed it as a bad idea, and few years later he we did have a long discussion okay, okay, of, of, of that, which I, I wasn't endorsing okay, right, the analysis, I was just reporting the analysis. I, I, I would like a, yeah. a, a little bit comment about what was before talking about mathematics, because I think there is one striking feature which uh, differentiates quantum physics from classical physics. Classical physics, or as far as we know, is explained by uh, real mathematics. That means you don't need complex numbers. You can use it as a device, mathematical device. You can uh, uh, Maxwell equations and so on reformulate in, in, but you can uh, formulate them also in classical. But in quantum physics, the use of uh, complex mathematics is essential. You cannot translate it into classical. So classical physics uses really real numbers, and quantum physics uses complex numbers, which is on mathematical level very different. And on one level also mathematical, the concept of spin. You know, spin is really what we call uh, a representation of SU2 group, unitary two-dimensional group that is really spin, which is one spin. Of. And what is mathematically the, the property of it is that if you rotate it by 2 pi, the function of spin spinner gets minus psi, which no object in real space has that property. No classical object. So that is really essentially in the ingredient of mathematics is what makes a quantum physics so weird from the point of view of classical physics. Because it is impossible to express quantum physics without use of complex numbers. What? Well, I mean, can I make a quick comment? Sorry. Sorry. I, I, I mean, I think the question why complex numbers seem to play such an essential yes. role in quantum physics is an extremely interesting question. I don't know of anybody who has a clear answer to it. Um, of, I, I, I should make the comment that 
the, the thing you just mentioned about if you rotate from 360 degrees a spinner, you get the negative. Yes. Nothing classical works like that. Yes. That's a bit of an, I mean, in a certain sense, nothing classical works like that is a bit of an exaggeration. So, um, I mean, this is the old trick that for people who don't know this, to illustrate this, Sheldon Lee Glashow used to do this, they called it the Glashow belt trick, right? So this is a very classical object, my belt, right? I know, I know that. Okay, I know you know, I'm gonna show you this. Okay. <laughs> Because this sounds weird, right? You say, I take an object, I spin it through 360 degrees, and it no longer comes back into the state it started in. But if I spin it a second time, yeah, it comes yeah, back to its yeah. state. So, so Gla what Glasshouse showed was this. Here's my belt, and I take one end of it, and I spin it through 360 degrees, and now it's got a twist in it, yes? And I can't actually undo that twist um, by, by moving things around. But if I spin it a second time, by a rotation, I have to do this carefully. By a rotation, I can actually undo the twist. So there are classical analogs to that behavior, can I, which, can which you can try and think through. So it's a little bit of an exaggeration. Can I just say one uh, real experiment here for certain spin? You have one spin particle, electron, you have spin, and you need it to go this way. And you go into gay two different ways simultaneously. Yes. And in one, in one way, it comes into the homogeneous magnetic field. Yes. And you rotate it by two pi. And then they come together and interfere. Yes. If you don't rotate it by two pi, it is experimentally one interference. If it rotates yes. experimentally, it's another picture. So the rotation by two pi is a real thing, experimentally true. <coughs> I mean, it's a very interesting phenomenon. Let, let sort of one one yeah. So, uh, can I? Sure, sure, sure. I, I would like uh, to to maybe move the discussion to some to give uh, the philosopher some food for thought because this is pretty technical, right? We we know Bon Macarano and everything, but uh, um, think of this, right? We are improving our concepts in in science. We believe in progress. We start from rough concepts and we go on and we apply ratio and we apply mathematics and our concepts become more powerful, more related to the real world. And now when we have real concepts, now we can describe the real world better, right? And we believe in progress. With, with, with time, we will improve our concepts. We will maybe introduce some new concepts which reproduce the previous level of reality on some deeper scale. So we believe in that constant rational progress of science <coughs> describing reality from some fundamental things, excitations, fields, or whatever, up there. But imagine this. As we started with weird uh, theories like special relativity, general relativity, quantum mechanics, we have been confronted with more and more paradoxes. Some of them are kind of resolved, some of them are resolved, but we feel uneasy about it, we, we would like to reformulate it a little bit better. And as we progress more and more, we find more and more of these paradoxes. So is it possible that the final level of knowledge that the science aims to approach is a paradox? <laughs> no! <laughs> Paradoxical sentences can't be true. I but mean, imagine this. There are, there, are, there, are, there are arrays of numbers, right? And all of them are rational numbers. Yet, they tend to the number which cannot be expressed as a rational number. So in a sense, the limit is not in the set of things that are well, there. So, so let me just say, look, um, Aristotle said long ago, helpfully, um, to say of what is that it is is true, to say of what is that it is not as false. Um, and I think the world is some way or other, right? I mean, you can construct paradoxical sentences in semantical sentences, like the sentence that says this sentence is not true. Okay? And though I have a whole book about those, they're public. <coughs> but one thing they're not is they're not true. <laughs> um, um, you can worry about what they are, but they're not true. If the world is some way, and it is, and you say it's the way it is, then what you said is true and can't be paradoxical. Um, I think to, 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 
Well, because the world is some way or other. I mean, so you believe, you really believe in it, right? You yeah, know. I really believe there's a world. I mean, this is the kind of thing you see. This is, isn't it weird that the physicists have to pay? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's strange. I'm taking one, I'm taking the other side. <laughs> I mean, look, exactly right. Historically, you think it's the philosopher who's saying, who says there's a world at all? Yeah. <laughs> Not you, but there's a world. And I'm saying, yeah, there's a world. There's a physical world at some point or other. Um, I want to find out how it is, or at least make a good guess, or how it might be. You know, Maybe we'll never know for sure. But I don't, but, but, I, I don't, I think to, or, or maybe the other way to put it is this. So Socrates, you know, um, in the Mino, when, when Mino's worried about how, how can we ever know the truth, right? And he has this paradox which is supposed to show you can never find out the truth about anything. And Socrates says at the end, he says, look, Mino, at least I know this. It, it makes us braver, <coughs> braver men and better people to believe that you could find out the truth and to keep looking for it than to take the lazy man's argument that says basically you can never know when you should know. <coughs> and, you know, um, I... I I believe there is a coherent actual physical world and therefore a coherent story, which in principle you could tell about how it is. No, I don't and that we should never give up on that, right? We should never, it, 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 it could blunt your desire to understand it, to think, well, maybe it's a fool's quest. Maybe somehow the world itself is incoherent, so there can't be a coherent account of it. Um, I don't really understand how that could be, but I also think it, it, it I don't know that it's good for you, right, psychologically, to, to, to be reflecting on that. No, I, I'm not saying that the world isn't there. I'm just saying that it might be incomprehensible. I'm saying that the brain that we use... Maybe we're not smart enough. The yes. brain that we use is a product of this universe. I mean, it's not a particularly good it's product... Limit to science. And yeah, and it's not a particularly good product. In many ways, it's related to rats' brains, right? right? So, you, you, you would have to admit yes. that there is a, a certain limit of, of, of what we feel appropriately explained. Although, you'd have to admit, if I look at the, at the detailed structure of the variation of the background cosmic radiation, right, and the distribution of angular, angular dependencies, and that I can derive that from an actually existing theory, mathematical theory. That's good. Cool. We can find out a heck of a lot about the world that you wouldn't have thought we could yeah, find out. Right. About. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Yeah, right. <laughs> Except for quadruple contribution. Except for quadruple contribution. <laughs> <laughs> How did I okay. experiment? Okay. Right. You want to comment on this? Well, uh, I think it's a, it's a reasonable question of the limit, uh, uh, limit of science, asking whether. Uh, progress is, uh, of science is uh, continuous and infinite, or, or is there, is there uh, some limit? But that is exactly a question for philosophers, I would say. Uh, well, these, because, these philosophers this, are not very well respected who think that you know, human <laughs> brains have <laughs> certainly uh, have evolved and as such have s some limitations which are inbuilt in it. And there are certain things, just as a, just as a dog cannot uh, count so we cannot comprehend quantum mechanics and that's it. And we're never going to know. We are not built so that so that we are able to know. Well, well, even uh, <coughs> what does it mean to know? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, well, it is. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but this is, I mean, actually, uh, I'm sorry, Brandon, just say for a second. We ought to be clear that we, we we switch the topic a little bit. So the thing I was originally objecting to is that there doesn't exist a coherent account. What you said is, then you said, well, there is one, but maybe we're not smart enough to ever find it. Right? So it, there, there, it, it switched from the topic, maybe the world isn't of such a kind as for there to be a coherent account of it, to maybe our brains aren't mm -hmm. sophisticated enough to ever find it. Now that second thing, if anybody reasonable would say, maybe, you know, maybe we're not smart enough. But here I'm sort of with Socrates. The only way we ever find out is if I keep trying. I mean, it would be a, it would be a pity to stop sure, sure, sure. because you say, well, I haven't been able to figure it out. Maybe you know, as human beings using cranium, we're not smart enough. Let's give up. Oh, right? Of course, of course. Of course. <laughs> that's what you're doing. Yeah. Except that the politicians could use this to make some very financial cuts. You had something. Well, <clears throat> this question.
question becomes uh, relatively important uh, when scientists start making extrapolations. Uh, as, uh, as the science progresses uh, at the front, of course, that you will always uh, do your best to solve uh, the next problem ahead. <coughs> and uh, there is no reason to stop uh, uh, in, in the search for, for the answers. Uh, but frequently, uh, people make uh, extrapolations from the present position. And if you extrapolate in death, uh, I mean uh, infinitely, to infinity, then uh, this question of uh, limit of science may become an issue. Uh, but okay, that's uh, uh, not, uh, usual, not, not, not a typical question of scientific progress that we know, know today. But it can become relevant, even f for philosophers, I would say. Can I, can I ask the student to yeah. raise the question? Thank you. Go ahead. I think this is a very simple question, actually. Um, uh, is there a possibility, uh, actually, do any of you think that um, a philosopher with no actual mathematical knowledge of um, rel relevant mathematics for understanding physical, for doing calculations in physics, uh, can such a philosopher be um, um, educated enough to resolve certain uh, conceptual problems in the conceptual part of theory in physics? Because, um, let me, uh, I mean, that's aiming very high. So, but let me say, I think why that's kind of aiming, I mean, to resolve the problems is aiming very well. Okay, can you, can, you can certainly learn enough to appreciate them <coughs> and therefore to teach them to your students so they appreciate them, maybe even the ones who have more mathematical ability. I mean, my guess is, you know, actual detailed progress in physics, you probably do have to have some mathematical talent because mathematical physics is a sophisticated mathematical thing. So if you're aiming to be the guy who solves the problem, that's going to be hard. But my point is, it's not that hard to understand and articulate, make clear what the problem is. Um, you know, it's not that hard to state Fermat's last theorem and understand what it says. It's really hard to prove. Okay, um, and and as for you know. Again, if, if, you think of your, if you think of a philosopher as partly being a conscience, it's enough to understand the problem, even if you don't think you're going to be the guy who cracks it. So that's, you know, just to encourage people who don't have a lot of you know, mathematical talent not to give up on it, I don't think you need to aim so high to be you know, the guy who's going to get the Nobel Prize. For <laughs> <laughs> well, um, when I was aiming at that question, is, um, whether it would be a better approach for, I don't know, to have teams that consist of physicists and philosophers, and neither the physicists know any philosophy nor do the philosophers <laughs> know any physics. I don't think that would work. Right. But uh, <laughs> a physicist who would learn a bit of philosophy on the side, yes. and a philosopher who would do a bit of physics, yes. would accomplish much more, I think, especially if I don't <coughs> stand with people who I agree. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. But then the question is what kind of philosophy should, should one learn and how one should learn it and how much of it and in which fields and so on. And then <laughs> we'll come back to the question of curriculum again. But I don't want to push that uh, yeah. too far. Look up. Um, I don't know if I'm talking, but uh, here it seems that we think that the only point where you can put together philosophy and physics and where you are this four from terrifying problems <laughs> and you end up there is a world up there to be represented. But I think there is an, another, another level where we should maybe think where we can have a fruitful collaboration. I mean, there is a kind of, uh, there are social practices where science is there. There are social practices where we take maybe Newtonian science, we don't know about this. And we should be judged. For example, she's working what we should do with cyclopaths. So one side you have uh, the law and 
they say when people are responsible for what they do. The other side are psychiatrists and they say, oh, we can't get scientifically when someone is a psychopath. Then there are people scanning the brain of these people, they say that something is going on there. And then we have to decide what to do with these people. And here is a problem interfacing languages. There is the law. In the notion of mens rea, the problem is based on the same folk psychology that the Romans have. Then there are psychiatrists that they use their own theory. Then there are those who scan the brain. And then there are people who end up in jail, or they end up in the hospital, or they are outside killing other people. So I was thinking, can we also think that somehow this debate between science and philosophy should be also somehow at this kind of upper level? Because, okay, the foundation of things are wonderful, complex, and surely we can imagine people could collaborate. But why worry what's going on outside when science translates in our lives? So, <coughs> shall we cure uh, children who have attention deficit disorder? One part of the answer seems to come from the other, but this is science who tell us that something is wrong with them. But then the point is, how do we have to take these statements that are this kind of scientific? So I would like maybe to, to pull this different direction, that is seeing the role of the philosopher in this kind of interfacing languages, trying to find a common story where the lawyer cannot <coughs> the psychology of the Romans because it was in the Roman law that now is part of our legal system. Mm. Has to be somehow renewed, <coughs> but not in terms of the fundamental physics. About this psychology that we have now, that is not so I was just launching this kind of different perspective of the problem. So I'm sorry because I'm putting out the physicists from the debate. Maybe it's fine. Thank you, but I, but I think they have also views about this. <laughs> okay. uh, do, you want, do you want to comment? I mean, I can comment. I mean, look, I, of course I think you're exactly right. It, it, you're, you're talking about a problem that has feet in a bunch of different disciplines. Um, one is <coughs> ethics, moral responsibility, philosophy of mind, neurophysiology. Um, right. And again, hopefully a well-trained philosopher is trained to keep conceptual categories clear. Let me give you a very simple example. A lot of people do these experiments now <coughs> it's really important to do brain scans, right? So they ask you to do some mental task, and they do a brain scan, and some part of your brain lights up. And they say, wow. And you say, well, what were you expecting? I mean, obviously the brain was doing something. Um, the fact that it's localized in one region, the psychological theory isn't defined that way. It's defined functionally. And so even if it was distributed, it wouldn't really tell you about the, the psychological architecture. Um, and I think they're just making mistakes, right? They're just sort of very easily slipping from something they see on a scan to a conclusion at a different psychological level that doesn't follow. And I think that's the kind of thing a philosopher can. You don't have to know fine details to point out that that's not a good move in terms of what's evidence for what. Um, sure. I mean, hopefully, hopefully a training in philosophy more than in any in individual science can get you acquainted with a lot of different problems and a lot of different fields. Not Again, good. not at the level of extreme detail you need to actually you know, work full time in that field. But sometimes knowing a bit about a lot of different things gives you a position where you can you know, clarify how they fit together. No, because some philosophers are the expert of interfacing languages in a sense. If we are it, it's one of the things we should be good at if we're able to do. Let me just ask you, uh, I mean, why do you think that's not a question at the front? It's just a different front. Right. I yeah, mean, it's yeah, not yeah. a front in, yeah. in theoretical physics. Maybe some neuroscientist uh, would be uh, could give you a much more adequate answer. But it's a it's a, it's a just a different uh, different front. It's a very fundamental question for in neuroscience, uh, and uh, in I mean, as far as I understand. So uh, I guess that uh, fair, enough, fair enough. But the point is, when this uh, neuroscience uh, sentences that we have about what's going on in the brain, are interfaced with the synthesis of the judge. Something happens very strange. Yes. How do we put together this perspective? Who can help that? 
it's the scary stuff because people end up in jail or they end up in hospital just because there are ways of putting together yeah, probably fundamental claims of neuroscientists and what the judges decide on the base of traditions that come from certain way of judging when someone is responsible for what he does. Yeah, of course, some think that it really what's the application of science that generates all this kind of work for philosophers. I don't want to be out of jobs. <laughs> But, but what, what you said to him about philosophy providing you uh, with the conceptual tools which eventually enable you to familiarize yourself with a, with a lot of different disciplines, I mean, this is uh, borne out quite clearly by the statistics about employability of philosophy majors in the United States, uh, which I mean, philosophy majors are really highly employable and, and, and among the most employable people in, the, in regard of the variety of disciplines in which they find uh, jobs. But that gets us back to the curriculum problem, <laughs> 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 the way philosophy uh, is taught. OK. Any more questions? Yes, please. OK. Uh, you all agree that mathematics and not philosophy is essential for doing science. But I think that the <coughs> question still remains that uh, why mathematics is applicable to physical world in the first place. So, is this a scientific question or philosophical? Is this a question that philosophy should ask, answer, or science? I think it's a scientific question, although I happen to be working on it <laughs> uh, in a very, very serious way. I mean, look, um, um, that's what really <laughs> what you want to do is understand why mathematics is, as it were, a good language to describe the physical world, where the physical world is not itself an actual mathematics, in, in a certain sense not a mathematics, certainly not a numerical object, let me put it that way. Um, it, it, I mean, this is going to a, a huge, I would, you know, now I would go on for unending hours about this, but let me just say very briefly, in antiquity, in, in ancient Greece, mathematics was, just, was divided into arithmetic and geometry. And arithmetic was just the theory of numbers by which they meant the counting of numbers. And geometry was the theory of magnitudes. Now, that geometry would be applicable to the world didn't seem at all odd, because we say the world just contains magnitudes, contains triangles and circles. And, you know, so <coughs> you study triangles and circles, why does that apply to triangular buildings? Well, obviously, because they're more or less triangular, right? Um, what happened over, over the course of time was that the numerical side, the algebraic side, which in, involved inventing a lot of new numbers, inventing rational numbers, then real numbers, and negative numbers, eventually geometry sort of became representable algebraically, and then everything migrated over into algebra. And now almost all mathematics is done algebraically with numbers. Now you say the world is not a numerical object. Why should all these numbers be good to represent it? But if you think that the, but the world could have magnitudes in it, you have to understand why numbers were good to do geometry with. And I think there's a, a, an interesting story. And this, the question that was raised before, why complex numbers? Why they see com coming up in physics? Why is that? What, what should the physical world be like that it has a structure which is well represented by complex numbers? It's a very good question, excellent question. Physicists have worried about it. I think philosophers, I mean, again, this is the kind of thing anybody in this field wants to worry about. Um, and, and from any side could make contributions to it, okay? Well, can I perhaps add something? Uh, uh, this is a very provocative question. In fact, uh, I was thinking a lot about it. So, what constitutes a mathematical proof? Right. We all know from, from our study, from, from, from our faculty, that you go from certain thing which appears to be obvious and you derive another statement or a thing which appears to be more or less obvious. And you derive another thing. And in this step of uh, apparently obvious progress, you, you prove a theorem. Right? So what is it? I'm now, I'm now intentionally speculative. It is a resonance of a human brain. It constantly resonated. It's good. Oh, oh it goes, oh, I get it. Oh, I get it, right? So could it be that the whole, I'm, 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 I'm intentionally speculative, that the whole mathematics is a resonance of a human brain, right? Which is good. Again, it's very, very good. 
but it's by no means universal. It's the resonance of a great matter, right? Which is good and can be useful for physics, right? But, but maybe we should not go too far with it. It's, it's our language, it's our language. Well, regarding, regarding mathematics, uh, if, I, if I might uh, just add, uh, well, there is, a, there is a very interesting question, and that is the question of, uh, of uh, axioms, axiomatics. I mean, uh, uh, I think that uh, that is a, could, be, could be a very philosophical point of, of, of mathematics, because uh, this is the starting point of, of proving theorems, after all, or at least yeah, some yeah, of them yeah, yeah, yeah. prove theorems from the claims of other theorems and you build the entire structure. Yes, yes but um, I mean, uh, it, it is a very interesting question even how we build uh, mathematics, these foundations, these axioms that are not, not proven but taken for granted, taken as claims which are not proven as a, as a, as a regular part of mathematical theory. So you have axioms. So why these axioms? What would happen if we change axioms? They, re they resonate. Yeah, they what? So you can extract them by resonance. No, I said, oh, that's okay. That's okay. Oh, I find it. Oh, that's okay. So in the end, it's very human for me. It could be interpreted that way. Oh, that, that's not good. That, 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 I, I think that the most disturbing problem with this is that mathematics is considered as a non empirical deductive science, mm -hmm. while physics is, for example, inductive and empirical science. So how something that is non-empirical and neglected can be applied to empirical and inductive math. So I think that, that this is the most disturbing problem in this question. Okay. Uh, concerning mathematics finance question, <coughs> I would like to raise a question about new theory for good theory. The first theory being that it is impossible to prove consistency <coughs> of arithmetic. That means of arithmetic which uh, uh, takes at least multiplication. If you have only addition and subtraction, you can prove consistency. The second thing is, assuming that mathematics is consistent, in mathematics there is at least one theory which is true, but which cannot be proven from the, the use of that. Now it's not can, a theorem. That is the second theorem. Now if you can take that as another axiom to add it to the, to the existing axiom, but then the same proof of him uh, applies. That is, in that new system, there's still one theorem which is true but not proven. That means in mathematics there are emphasis number of true theorems which cannot be proved. They're not so theorems. So in mathematics, now, if mathematics <coughs> describes physical reality, what does that tell us about our ability to comprehend physical reality? So, uh, there is an infinite number of theorems proved. Right? Well, that is what gave a really answer to, to David Hilbert, uh, his famous list of uh, 26 questions on the beginning of the 20th century, 1900, when he put down uh, unsolved uh, problems in mathematics, he thought they are the most important problems to be proven in the 20th century. Until now, all problems are really proved. Mm -hmm. well, he put one problem which he put is to prove consistency of mathematics. Put together, prove that it is impossible to prove. But that is how David Hilbert stated it. That one problem of the 20th century is <coughs> to make a proof that mathematics is consistent. Was, he was the, last, the last problem was proven in 1990. <coughs> no, that, that was the last of Hilbert. I can just make a brief. Look, yeah. um, I, I think that <coughs> the actual impact of both those theorems, they're, they're <coughs> very interesting theorems, but the impact is, very is much less than you're suggesting. So let me very say. Very I agree with you. Um, what uh, is the impact in the future? So, so for, but let me just make it. <laughs> One could see instantaneously there have to be mathematical proofs that aren't theorems, because there are only going to be countably many theorems, and there are probably uncountably many yes. mathematical proofs. So that's tr absolutely trivial. I mean, it's interesting that what Gödel could do is actually, given an axiomatic system, produce such, on, on the assumption your axiomatic system is consistent, he could produce an example. 
which was nice. But that there would be examples of mathematical truths that aren't theorems in any finite axiomatic system is trivial. I give you one example. Fur furthermore, I give you one example. Each prime number is the sum of two, uh, each uh, even number is the sum of two prime numbers. Well, we don't know yet about, about, to be no, but we don't know about Goldbach's conjecture. Yeah. We don't know that yet. And the, 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 to be. But, but there's a, well, it's not clear, there's a lot of mathematical trivia in fact, most mathematical truths are, as you would say, mathematical trivia. Yes. The question is whether, are there interesting mathematical truths that you need to do physics that aren't theorems? And therefore, you'll never be sure of it. I don't think we have any, any, any reason to believe that's the case. It, it, it's kind of amazing that, that you know, most of the interesting questions seem to have been things that, that, that you got proofs of, except like Fermat's last theorem an example, even though that wouldn't have any real physical consequences. So I, I, you know, I have all respect for Gödel, but I don't think those two theorems actually have a, 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 any noticeable impact on physics or the prospects for physics at all. So that's just okay. Let's let's allow some other people to ask questions. So, yeah, so just, just to say one thing uh, about actions and what we care them this way and stuff like that. Uh, first thing that there is no need to prove them or they work or they don't. So. In a funny way, we could say that everything in math is based on set theory, and set theory is based on axiom of empty set. And it's weird, but it works. And why do we use this one? We tried with naive theory, and now we have it's a metal flag, and it's working. We have planes, we have buildings, we have bridges, we have bombs, and the answer to this relation between math and physics, it works. And then, like it's, uh, and, and the axioms gives us a good base to see the connection. We have math, physics, and the outcome, which is seems for now very good. Uh, axioms in the end are chosen. In a yeah. Way. yeah. So because the question like is, the, of course, I. Uh, uh, but the question is whether you could choose a different set of axioms that is also consistent, and then build another mathematics that could be even more useful for physics. Perhaps. Yes, it's possible. Well, but so, so uh, essentially, essentially, there is uh, <coughs> also some space in exploring the axiomatic structure and building other useful formulations upon it. So, okay, it's, it's, it's a bit abstract, but for me, it's a. We have we can can space, in space. In axioms, we have sterile space, with different axioms. So obviously we're developing sure. it. Yeah. We're developing yeah. that. But the yeah. idea of proving axioms, then you can always general generalize spaces to metric spaces or whatever, which will which will uh, uh, simply unify all these examples that you set. But uh, uh, the question is whether you can change some even more basic axioms and produce a, a whole other mathematics. But I, I don't know the answer. In set the theory, you tried everything and. For now, this one works very well. And you have other set theories. Well, I don't contest that. It's the question whether there is something even more useful. I mean, set theory isn't quite as cut and dry. There's a question about the axiom of the bottom. I've got a lot of data. Yeah. The axiom of choice. What's the status yeah. of the axiom of choice? <coughs> uh, sorry, it's just it's in a funny way, because the axiom of empty set is kind of weird. So I said, you have to define an empty set and base with other axioms on that one. Right, but I, so in the particular case, the axiom of choice, I know mean, there are actual mathematicians who want to avoid it, who try to avoid it if they can. They prefer proofs without it. And there's an interesting question about what its status is, even according to mathematicians. You know, is it arbitrary, is it true, is it false? I mean, that's a long conversation. I just want to say that there, even in set theory, at a very foundational level, you have an axiom about which there's a lot of debate. It's not, it's not as straightforward as there's just one, so then everything follows from that and everybody's happy about it. So. Yeah. Antonio, you look a little bit disgruntled. Do you have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't like this argument of, of, uh, of using uh, the things that we can do to, to approve the validity of, of our basic insights and the theories, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, in fact, this is something that, that happens these days in science. Mm. So people can do a lot. They can put a lot of particles in a box 
and especially when it comes to applying physics to biology. You can really simulate a lot of things, put a lot of proteins in, seeing how atoms move and uh, in building up on that. Some people even say they can reconstruct the whole cell, which is an obvious lie, right? And uh, so, so uh, the, 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 the concept is this. Irrespectively of the thing that we can really do something with it, like calculate that, right? the acidity, it doesn't mean that we really understand it. For example, nobody really understands biology. It's a completely, I would say, a, a discipline, discipline that, that would need a, a tough reconsideration. I mean, it's not, it's not bad, uh, that, that's very good for people who are doing it, but, but we as physicists would like to understand it in some other terms. We, I feel, personally, that it would be very difficult to build a consistent theory of biology starting from particles. Because I don't see how it, re how it, re it represents life in the end, what does it mean? And, and so, so the idea of, of something being useful is not good to to be used as the argument for, for the for the theory. I don't think that would because ants could say, oh, we've been using the idea of cut, cutting leaves and you know we transport leaves from, from this place to another place and it has served us well, right? And uh, so but they don't have a good theory of the universe, I don't <coughs> look 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 at some well, I'm sure that usefulness can be used as proof, as, as definitive proof. But, um, for example, imagine a, a paradox, uh, imagine a, a hypothetical situation where we, we discover a proof that proves that mathematics is inconsistent or something. It doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, something that's not likely to happen. But imagine that it is the case. Would that change the applicability of mathematics to real life and fundamental problems of physics. It couldn't. No. So that's the whole point. That, that doesn't mean that we that it, it serves that the usefulness uh, and the predictable power of predictable sure, sure. Uh, we agree. Yeah. So. Okay. Well uh, I think we <coughs> We are sure that we cannot resolve this problem of relationship with, of mathematics with, uh, with uh, philosophy and, uh, uh, and physics. So I propose to come back to the relationship of uh, physics with philosophy. And uh, <laughs> so, because I want to show that it's, uh, this relationship cannot be resolved neither. And uh, just to cite uh, Einstein, who may be considered the greatest physicist and the greatest ph philosopher of the 20th century. I think many of us would uh, agree on that statement. And so, uh, for instance, look at his uh, philosophical positions. So he started as a positivist. He, he is considered to be, well, by rejecting ether and so on, and all the, the beginnings of the theory of relativity. Then uh, he, he was working on, uh, on general theories of relativity, he was a Platonist in a way. He, he tried to do physical theory and he did not succeed uh, what he did in 1912, 1915 and so on. And at the end, he was uh, attacking uh, the, <coughs> the foundations of uh, quantum mechanics. He was realist. So he, he, he did everything that is possible, exactly the most uh, opposite positions in philosophy. Because I would like to come back to your question, asking what, uh, what uh, philosopher would, could contribute. So he is a philosoph philosophical opportunist. Uh, <laughs> so it is exactly the opposite of any real philosopher would do in its life. Just to stick to one position and would say, I uh, because I think the most important thing is to have a system and everything to adapt to your system. Physicist is a, a philosophical opportunist. No, 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 no. When, whenever he is confronted with a new problem, he tries whatever he can. And uh, even, well, this happened to, to many physicists. Uh, I can cite uh, Max Planck and so on. He was extremely opposed to the Boltzmann theory. And he, he was uh, 
he was <coughs> forced by by the some inner uh, uh, inner logic of things to, to to abandon his his very uh, very profound ideas he had. So maybe we can discuss about this. I have to disagree. I have to disagree because I mean, the, uh, think of Bertrand Russell, think of uh, Wittgenstein, think Pat of no. Putnam. Pat uh, <laughs> these are these are people. These are, I mean, and I think, and I like that because they 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 think hard and they change their opinions. And of course, they they see new avenues where they uh, where, where they can push. Then they ch might tra change their mind again and then try and then try something else. And so I, I don't think this is you know this idea you know. You have to be born a Platonist uh, and then stick to your Platonism for the rest of your life, no matter what. Uh, I, that's, that, I think this is a wrong picture of, of uh, what philosophy is no, like. Uh, well, maybe I no, but if you have a system, well, a philosopher has to to construct a system which would, would be uh, useful for for everything. Mm -hmm. I think physicist uh, uh, is uh, uh, after sometimes he. He has to admit that in some, uh, he, he told uh, when he, he was in a discussion with Heisenberg, and he, uh, when uh, he told Heisenberg, uh, just theory uh, decides what can be measured. But uh, Heisenberg said, but Mr. Einstein, but you said it was you, Mach and all these things, uh, you, you say exactly the opposite of what you said before. And he said, oh, yes, but uh, the good jokes have to be. Uh, have been, Told just once. But okay, so let, let me. I, I I actually think that there are famous things that Einstein also says that the physicists will seem to be completely unscrupulous. And blah, blah. I think the fact about Einstein is that from beginning to end he was a realist. Yes. From beginning to end he believed there was a physical world. He wanted to know what it was like. He says I wanted to know the thoughts of God. The the early arguments against absolute time and Newtonian picture of space and time um, are realist arguments. They're just saying, look, why should I believe here's a, a structure that classical physics has been assuming, but maybe it's wrong. Let me, think, let me think about why I should believe that structure is there, which is going to go through phenomena, right? What are the phenomena? Maybe the phenomena don't suggest that it has to be there. Um, and certainly, his issue about quantum mechanics was, was always purely realist, as you said. And I, I think, I mean, he had strong <coughs> aesthetic opinions about the, the beauty or harmony or clarity that he thought the true theory must hold. But I think all of those things, now the one mistake he made was he thought the theory of relativity vindicated Mach's principle. He was just confused about that. And later on, he says, no, I was wrong about that. And he was wrong about it. So he was confused for a while. But I don't think that was a philosophical confusion. That was just a confusion of thinking that Mach's principle was actually vindicated in the theory of relativity, which it just isn't. So I, I think if you ask me philosophically, he was consistently a realist from the beginning to end. Um, he found himself in different positions in, in, in trying to go forward in understanding physics. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, the time is up. Uh, thanks very much uh, for contributing your questions, for uh, being here and, and uh, joining me in thanking my interlocutors here at the round table. <laughs>